All right, so first of all, I have to tell you that running a marathon will be the most exciting thing in your life you have done or will do. It is going to change your life. You will not believe you have done it when you cross that finish line because it is probably one of the most insurmountable goals and dreams that most runners have is to run a marathon and you're gonna do it. So we are so excited that you joined us for this journey because it truly is a journey that will take you all the way to November 1st, the icing on the cake after all your training. And we wanna make sure you get there ready to run, prepared, no injuries, hydrated, wearing the right clothes. So that's why we call this the everything you wanna know about running a marathon because there is so much to learn. Um, so tonight we're gonna start off with kind of like the head to toe approach. So first you have to learn how to dress like marathoners. And if you think about it, we're gonna be going through three seasons. So it's important to know how to dress for those three seasons. And we have just the perfect person to tell you, Troy Squires from Jack Rabbit. is gonna tell you how to dress from head to toe, the important sneakers and everything else to wear. Hey, thanks Gail. Um, so yeah, I, I admire uh, Michael spoke before me and his brevity. I won't be quite so succinct. Um, what I'm handing out is marathon gear checklist. So I'm sure there's things that I'll forget to talk about. This is to uh, sort of jog your memory, start the conversation. Maybe there's things you see on this list that you want to ask me about. Gail's always really good at reminding me of the things I forget to talk about. So everybody's new to this. I feel like um, I won't try to explain, I mean, because you can't, what's going to happen on, what's the date this year, November 1st? You know, what it's going to be like to cross that finish line. You don't really have to worry about that right now. You know, you just have to worry about getting started. So um, I want to, you know. Uh, we don't have to worry about that right now. So I won't try to explain everything, but just enough to get you started. And like I said, if you have questions, um, just shout them out during my presentation. Uh, honestly, it helps me talk about the things you want to learn about. You don't have to save the questions at the end. Um, and I will be here afterwards if you want to ask more questions to me personally. Uh, so what's on that marathon gear checklist? I think Gail said it's head to toe, but it's really toe to head. Because <laughs> uh, the shoes are the most important part. Um, at Jackrabbit, does anybody know our store? Has anybody been to, to our store? So we have four locations. I'm the manager of the 72nd Street store, so up on the Upper West Side. Um, that is currently the best Jackrabbit store. So <laughs> they're, they're all very, very good. Um, but I, our staff is really amazing. We have some of the best shoe fitters and we can really help you out. Um, it is important to get comfortable footwear. It is important to get uh, good fitting and supportive uh, footwear. It's, Nice if you can get good looking footwear, but it's, it's, that's icing on the cake. So I just brought some little samples of things that you know, I could show you. This is one of my favorite shoes, Mizuno Rider. Okay, why is it uh, a good shoe? Because it's very light, but still supportive and durable. Um, here's a classic New Balance, right? It's also very light. You know, we're living in the golden age of running shoe technology. All the shoes are light now, so you actually can't buy heavy shoes anymore. They're all like a few ounces lighter than they were a few years ago. So you'll be surprised at how much uh, you get, how much cushioning and support you get out of something like that. And that only weighs, that's like a men's size 12, it only weighs like 12 ounces. Um, this shoe only weighs like four ounces, but this is just the fun shoe. It's not the practical shoe for you. Um, everybody here is a first time marathoner, right? So it's more important that your feet are comfortable when you're running those 26 miles, then uh, you're wearing the lightest shoe possible. So if you're a competitive marathoner, you know maybe next year we can talk about this shoe um, when you're going for a PR. But probably you're going to run the, the race in the same shoe you train in. Um, you know these are trainers. This is a racing shoe. <coughs> but let's say you're racing a marathon or you're running a marathon, so you're probably going to be running the marathon in a in a trainer because that's going to give you more support and cushioning. Um, those shoes are good for four to five hundred miles. So when when does your training start? July or oh, sooner? Yeah. You're already running. Yeah. They started Is it what? 30th. Twenty week program? Twenty third. <laughs> Darn, you're in good hands. Yes. Okay, <laughs> um, that's that's really good. You'll be well, well prepared. A lot of times people are like in a sixteen week program, so you're you're going to be way ahead of all those sixteen. 
Um, so you need shoes now. I mean, are you all doing okay? Or you, you, some of them are starting to realize that like, okay, I probably do need better shoes as the runs get longer and longer. Um, now is the time to figure that out. Okay, so you get fit now. And probably what's gonna happen sometime in October, you're gonna go back and you're gonna buy another pair of the same shoe you trained in. Shoes are good for four, four to 500 miles. You're gonna get pretty close to that in your training if you can believe it. Um, so you want a fresh pair for race day. You don't want it to be brand new on race day. But if you like the shoe you're training in, come get a new pair sometime in October. Run in it for a couple weeks and it'll be ready for the marathon. If you don't like the shoe you're training in, then you know sooner than later come and get new shoes, different shoes, so you have time to figure it out before the race. Um, what else is on that list? So you know, going from toe to head, the shoes are the most important. Um, socks are probably the second most important. So um, non-cotton socks. Basically, one thing I would stress is that everything, like I'm wearing a cotton t-shirt, is very comfortable, uh, but I'm not running right now. Um, when you are running, when you are perspiring, you do want to wear non-cotton clothing. Cotton's really comfortable until you start sweating because it does not wick, okay? It does not pull moisture off your body. It does not keep you dry, okay? So you want to be wearing synthetics. Or something a lot of people wouldn't think about with uh, exercise is wool. Wool socks are excellent. Uh, if you're sweating or if it's wet out, they're actually the, wool is actually the fastest wicking material you can find. So wool socks are very popular. And we do sell some wool tops. Most of it's synthetic though, okay? So light, synthetic stuff. It's really hot. Um, I went running today. I was wearing synthetic, synthetic clothing and I was still sweating. There's nothing you can do about it. But, um, you know, in, in some ways, I, like I said, I can't explain everything that's gonna happen between now and November. As Gail said, you're gonna be training through three seasons. So it is gonna come up, because you're not gonna cancel practice. It is gonna come up. Like, what do we do when we run in the rain? And what are we gonna do when we run in the snow? Um, We'll cross that bridge when you get to it. Uh, the the, the non-cotton rule still applies, but we, you know, I'd say like I'm not going to try to explain that now. Just come back into Jackrabbit, you know, sometime when that happens, you know, September, October, uh, when you have a cold run, and we'll we'll sell you a pair of tights or a base layer or something like that. Okay. Um, what else is in there? Oh, body glide. Every, every runner's best friend, does anybody know about body glide? Body glide. So body glide goes in the same category, I think slightly further down. In the middle of important but not critical, there's nip guards. Okay, so sometimes when you're running, you tend to chafe because your body parts rub together. Okay, when you're sweating, that chafing or that rubbing is exacerbated. So if it's raining out or if you are sweaty, you tend to chafe. Body glide will prevent that. Okay, body glide is just this thing here. It looks like a deodorant stick a lubricant and you can rub that underneath your arms between your legs I won't tell you all the places but any place where you think you might chafe You'll find that out. Um, or you have chafed in the past okay uh, that's where you want to put the body glide you can even put it on your feet okay so hopefully with properly fitted footwear and non-cotton socks you won't have any blister problems but if you do have persistent blister problems still put the body glide on put the sock on put the shoe on and that should help. So body glide is your friend. It's like $8, and it'll make your life much, much better. When you get into the shower after a run, you'll be happy that you had the body glide on. That's when you find out where all the chafing happens, uh, when the hot water hits it. So um, nutrition, this you are gonna have to figure out sometime between now and November 1st. Has anybody used gels before? Okay, so um, Lauren's gonna talk about some nutrition stuff. I won't go too deep into it, but you know, this is not magic food, but when you run for, I'm, I'm guessing over three hours, for most of you over four hours, okay, so if you're an average person, it's going to take you over four hours to do this marathon. I don't know if you knew that. Um, <laughs> when you run for over four hours, you cannot store enough uh, sugar in your blood to, to fuel that. Um, at some point, your body's going to have to start burning either fat, possibly muscle, uh, unless you give it more sugar. So this is not magic food, there's nothing like mysterious in here, it's just basically sugar in a portable form. Portable and easily digestible, so you can't like bring a pizza with you. Because uh, it's hard to carry, it's messy, and also it takes a long time to digest and get the energy from that pizza. So you eat the pizza the night before, or maybe you make a wiser choice, um, but you eat something the, the night before, and this you can eat on the run. 
when your runs start to get, so what's the longest run we've done so far? Uh, I think six. Six, six miles, so pretty solid. It took you about uh, probably over an hour, right? You probably didn't have to fuel on that run, but once you get up to that hour and a half place, you're gonna have to start thinking about fueling, okay? So again, you know, one thing I want to reinforce is like, this isn't all the answers all at once, like you don't have to know everything from my lecture. But I say, you know, we're a resource, so come into the store, we'll talk about the gels. If you can't stand the gels, I mean, this is the easiest to eat, it's the easiest to digest. This is what they give on the course. They'll be giving you one of these power bar gels, so that might be one to try. But there are different brands. Here's Cliff. Um, Hammer, one of my favorites. Personal recommendation, Hammer Vanilla. Um, honey, Honey Stinger. So the sugar in this is honey. Um, if you can't stand the gels, the consistency of the gels, there are other options. This is like a gummy chew. It's delicious. Um, this is what I like to train with. But it does require some chewing. So some people say, well, I don't want to chew while I'm running. And some people say, well, I can't stand that consistency of the gels. I mean, take your pick. You'll be happy that you had something with you after you run for several hours. You'll just feel a lot better. Um, generally, I brought some quick bars. Generally, on the run, you're not going to eat a bar. It's just you know too hard to chew, too hard to digest. This is more of a post a post run food. Okay. Uh, other good post run foods include food. You know, just like regular food. Um, anything with a little bit of protein in it. But again, this is like convenient. It's portable and it's convenient. So if you're traveling to your workout and you're not going to be home right afterwards, or you want to like cook, um, you can eat a clip bar. That's eight grams of protein, ten grams of protein and that'll get you the, the quick protein right after your workout that you need, okay? And then later you can go eat some healthy food, which is, is also important. Um, where are you gonna carry all this stuff? Like you're running and you have to carry all this nutrition? Not that it's that much. Maybe you have to carry your phone. Maybe you have to carry your keys. Um, we've got that too, okay? So everybody always complains like we, with the running shorts, I mean, like they say, I need a running short that will carry, has a pocket for my keys, uh, my wallet, my phone, and everything like that, and all my nutrition. Like that, that short doesn't exist. You know, <laughs> shorts never have enough pockets for everything you want to carry. It's best to go to some kind of external device. Okay, so buy the shorts that are comfortable and look good, and then buy the spy belt to carry whatever you want. This looks really small, but it will expand to be about yay big. So if you have an iPhone Plus, Six or whatever it's called, it'll fit that. Um, it, it actually gets a big key. It'll fit your uh, your keys and your metro card, and it'll fit your nutrition. Okay. What it won't carry is water. So you do need to hydrate. You have coaches, right? So the coaches will discuss this with you. you know, how much should you eat? One of those gels is about 100 calories. You're gonna eat one of those every 45 minutes to an hour. But again, I'm sure your coaches. Lauren's coming. And Lauren's gonna cover that. Sorry about that one. <laughs> In more detail. Uh, but she's going to talk about hydrating also, I assume, because you're going to sweat. You're going to need to replace that. How do you carry it? That's, my, that's actually my business. How do you carry the water, though? It's a you know, handheld water bottle. You know, I thought these would be terrible before I tried it. You know, who wants to carry a water bottle? But it has like a little device so you can hold it without really gripping. You can relax your hand and run naturally. Um, it's really not so bad. Your other option is to get a belt. Same story. You think it's terrible? It doesn't look that cool. I mean, it might be. <laughs> but it's sort of like the gels. You might not love them, but it's necessary. You'll be really happy you have the water. Um, on race day, you, you don't, don't really need, need to bring your belt um, because they're going to give stuff. you water on the course. And that's one of the nice things that you get when you run the New York City Marathon. Water every mile and Gatorade. Yeah, yeah. So that's you don't have to worry about this on but in your training, you should hydrate, especially during the summer, right? You're gonna have to carry, carry water. It's very different when it's <coughs> 85 degrees like it was today versus when it's 40 degrees. Hopefully it'll be 45 degrees on race day and sunny and not windy at all. So that's, that's ideal. <laughs> ideal we'll put in the request. Yeah, well usually you get pretty good weather. We have, we've been very um, lucky. Yeah, I, I, every, almost every uh, marathon that I can remember going back about a decade Nice weather. Um, 
you know, what, what else? Is, is there anything else on there that, that people are seeing that I'm not talking about that you're curious? I'm interested in the watch that you would recommend. Yes, so watches. Um, so I have this Timex. This is about the most basic watch you can get. It tells the time. <laughs> right now it's about 6.55, according to my watch. And it also has a timer on it. I know from where you're sitting, you can't really see this, but this is what I used to time my run. Today I ran for 35 minutes. Um, it also has splits, so when you say run a race, you can time every mile. When you pass the mile marker, you hit the split button, and then you can go back and look and say, oh, I did that mile in 10 and a half minutes. Better speed up or slow down, whatever your race pace is. So that's, that's the most basic. I mean, I like training with a watch. Your, your, your coaches will give, give you advice on training, and I think your training is going to be mostly uh, mileage based. Um, I kind of like time-based training because it's very simple, you know, I'm just going to go run for an hour and this watch will time me. And when it says an hour, I'll go home. Um, <laughs> but, getting more complicated, I did bring uh, an example of a Garmin watch. And I think this has to do somewhat with, um, it's not like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an awesome marathoner, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a $400 watch, or I'm a bad marathoner, I'm going to buy a $60 watch. It's more just your personality. Some people like a lot of information, some people like electronics, some kind of like not guy, so I like to keep it simple. Um, but this will give you a lot of information. It'll tell you using a satellite, track you anywhere on the planet, it'll tell you how fast you're running, how far you've run, and that gives you a lot of freedom. So if your assignment one day is to run five miles, you don't have to plan the route, you don't have to know the, the, the distance, you just turn on the watch and go running and then you'll know when you run five miles. Um, you can also look at your, you know, if your coach says, well I think you're your training pace now today should be about 10.30s, okay. What, what, how do you know what that is, right? This watch will let you look at your wrist and be like, oh, I'm running that 10.30 that he said, or, or, or not, and then you can adjust your pace accordingly. So you can see your real-time pace. That's pretty cool. Um, that'll help you on race day, because race day feels totally different than training day. A lot of people get really excited and start running really, really fast. <laughs> it's not a good idea, <laughs> especially at the beginning of a marathon. So this will help you know, keep you honest. So even if your body doesn't feel like it normally does, this will at least it'll give you the factual information. So uh, this watch costs about $250. The least expensive satellite watch is about $130. So not too bad. And then this, will, like I said, it costs about $60. Can you tell me if that one, your Timex one, yeah. does that to measure the distance as well? No. This does not know how, how far or how fast. It's just a timer. So in order to do the, the distance, you need to have either a satellite or they do have ones that will take it off, like a, a shoe pod or something like that. It's like a motion sensor. But I think pretty much everybody's going satellite now. GPS technology is so good and so accurate and getting cheaper and smaller. I just get a satellite watch. You know. uh, that's, the, that's really the way to do it. Um, there's a lot of companies that make them. Garmin, I, that's the watch I would buy, this Garmin 220, if I were buying a watch today. But again, find one that suits your personality. If you're a triathlete, you can get one that measure your swim and bike and run time. Also heart rate monitor. I don't think you really worry about heart rate training. No. But you can get a heart rate monitor on that. And then that way you can, you know, go back home, upload it to your computer and just pour over all that data. You know when I'm running a ten thirty mile, my heart rate's at one sixty you know all that kind of stuff. As you get more fit you'll say, Oh I'm running a ten ten minute flat mile and my heart rate's only like one yeah, if that's what you're into. That's not what I'm into. Honestly, uh, you know, running, I mean, one reason why I like running is it's just it's simple. You know, it's freedom. So you go out your door, you start running. <laughs> Most of the time. Not today. Um, I had kind of a hard time today. It's, it's hot out. But, you know, the, the reward will come in November. It's very simple. You, you train, and then the race will it'll be great. Um, did we miss anything else? Hats, visors, these things are, uh, you know, they're self-explanatory. A nice light hat will be great if it's sunny out, keep the sun off your head, keep the sun out of your eyes. If it's rainy out, people like to wear hats, it's rain out of your eyes too. Um, what else on there is not, I mean, not self-explanatory? Yeah, yeah uh, massage, massage tools? Massage tools, that's actually, you know, when somebody comes in, even if they're not,
with Team for Kids or not, not saying that they're going to be marathon running. I think there's three things a beginning runner needs, shoes, socks, and then massage tool, actually, would be the third, before I'd sell them a running watch or anything else. Um, if you're running with any regularity, you do need to stretch, but I think even more than effective than stretching is rolling. So does anybody recognize this device? <laughs> yes. Maybe Lauren's going to go more in, in well, depth. Well, we have another clinic that we the rolling discuss clinic. that. The but having this clinic. around is, uh, you know, it's. I feel like it, I'm your dentist and I'm telling you to floss, like I'm serious. <laughs> Do it. It's really good for you. Um, basically, uh, what I've learned, and this is, this is not real science, but any part of your body that hurts, what, whatever it is, it's probably because your IT band's tight. So roll that out and then everything else goes away. Your IT band runs from the outside of your uh, knee up to your hip. On runners, it gets very tight, okay? So it's you can stretch it, you know, you can, uh, this, that's somewhat effective, but more effective, this is great. Uh, <laughs> Is and rolling while he's it out. doing this, we will go over this in our sports injury. Okay. Very so detailed. basically, you know, this allows you to use your body weight to get a deep massage on those big muscles. Okay. What I forgot to bring, there are. So I was doing the IT IT man there. You can do your calves, you can do your hamstrings, you know, all sorts of places. This is what I would sell everybody first. There are compliments to the to this. What I forgot to bring was a handheld stick. So maybe you've seen that. It's like a stick you can hold in your hands and you can rub your, your calves and your IT bands. Um, the stick is okay. It's, uh, it's easier to use. You know, you can sit in a chair and watch TV and do it, so you can basically be lazy. Um, but it's not as effective because you're, you're, you know, you're using your muscles to try to get a massage. This one you're using your body weight, so it's like you can't help but get you know, deeper in there. Um, if you can, you can avoid buying this if you can afford to get a professional massage every day or so. Um, <laughs> a professional massage is a good idea, but um, that's for me. That's like a once in a while, you know, once a, every couple of months that I would go to see a professional. In the meantime, you have to do it yourself. So, uh, definitely get a, some kind of foam roller. Some of them look different. We call it a foam roller. That one's not actually made of foam. Most of them are like foam. Um, the grid is just a little bit more premium does the same thing. Um, anything else? I mean, Gail, you're always good at like reminding me of what you wanted me to talk about that I forgot. Um, I think you've covered it all and you're going to stay, right? I'm going to stay. We need to move on. Yes. Yeah, I know. I always take like all this time in the morning. So I've got science and she has to rush through it. So um, you all got the marathon checklist. What's on the back of that? Is it a half marathon checklist? No, it's our store location. That's what I was hoping. Um, so that's where we are. Come see us. Um, you know, I'd be happy to help you out, but really the staff is great. I happen to know this because I know everybody works uh, for us at all the stores. Um, so you know what I mean, I just want to emphasize that we are a resource for you, and uh, just come in and talk to us as you have questions. And then, you know, thanks for having me. I'll Stay be around. over here. Yeah. 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 Everybody in the store are runners. You can try your shoes on, return your shoes. They have a treadmill, so um, we cannot overstate how important everything from your to toes, especially your shoes, are for marathoners and runners. And these are great. And the first time you use one, get in a soundproof room because you <laughs> will scream. <laughs> they really hurt. Um, so we're going to be throwing a lot of information at you tonight. That's why we have our notes and our nutrition things. There's just a lot of information to learn about running 26.2 miles. We're going to do our best to get it all in here tonight. Um, but you have to really live the life of a marathoner. You have to become marathoner. You are marathoners in training right now. So soak up the information. Ask your coach. Um, ask anyone you know who has run a marathon what it was like or what they did. Get used to getting up early. Get your runs in. I mean, this woman over here got up at 4 o'clock this morning to get her run in. That's dedication. And that's what it's going to take to get to that finish line. Um, so now, now that you know how to dress, fueling is the most important thing. We, we call it like it's definitely part of your training. You have to know how to fuel. And Lauren, who is not only a marathoner, an Ironman finisher, she's amazing with everything you'll need to know to fuel for a marathon. Thank you, Kathy. Hi, and thanks. Uh, yeah, so my name is Lauren, and um, it took me 
what, three minutes to walk here from my office so it's conveniently oh. located. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so welcome, and it's great to see you all. You know, those of us that love the sport of running and marathons and have done these, we get so excited every time we're in a room of people who have never done it before. It's <laughs> like, you know, you can only do something for the first time once, um, so that excitement is so great. And no, I was just laughing. We have a lot of all different kinds of roller devices that my husband, who's also a runner, and I use. And then our kids play with them. It's like a thing. You know, every night everybody gets out the rollers. So um, I think we all end up using those, and they're really helpful. So I know Gail gave me a little extra time this time, but I'm going to speak quickly anyway, because the whole field of nutrition for marathoners, you know, I could stay here for a really long time, but we won't. Um, so I think the first quick thing, and you all have, or if you do not have, you will receive, and Gail can send you. We will make sure you have, however you want, electronic or physically, uh, a copy of this and access to my email or information if you have a question. The first little thing on here, I think it's always just really interesting to remind yourself um, how much you really expend when you're running. So you expend about 100 calories per mile, plus or minus. So if you run a 10 minute mile, that's 600 calories an hour, those super fast, lightning fast, five minute mile people are burning a lot more than that. But let's say we're all burning somewhere between 600, 800 plus calories an hour, that's a lot. So you know these take a lot of energy, a lot of fueling, a lot of thought. Uh, doesn't mean we need to eat like burger and fries and ice cream every night when we're done running, that will undo it. But you know, just to keep it in perspective. And then the next part, especially because I see so many people talking about carbs and are carbs good? and you know, oh, I'm only taking in X, Y, Z, small number of carbs. You could burn 150 grams of carbs per hour. So if you see like the Atkins diet or this low carb diet, they're eating 100 or 200 grams a day. That does not work. That doesn't really work for anyone in my book, but definitely does not work for runners. So if anyone has any friends who are doing these or if you are currently doing really low carb diet for any reason, now's the time to start shifting that a little bit. You're gonna need those, um, as you were saying, those carbs are our energy, they are our fuel. Um, and so we sweat. Sorry, we sweat, even the ladies, we sweat. Uh, but the better shape you get in, the more you sweat, the hotter it is outside, the more we sweat, especially until we're acclimated. So the average runner is going to sweat about a liter of fluid an hour. That's kind of disgusting if you think about it, but it's great because it cools us off, and if it didn't happen, we wouldn't be able to go very far. Um, but that means we need to really be replacing that. And then I throw in the piece on sodium because, you know, I feel like the active people, the health-minded folks that are running and training for a marathon like yourselves are the ones who are going to read the American Heart Association guideline and stick to the sodium guidelines and eating really low, low salt and then complaining to your coaches that your muscles are cramping and you're dizzy. So really low sodium diets are not necessarily um, advantageous to marathoners. We need salt. You're going to sweat a lot. Um, like about the amount the American Heart Association says to take per day, you'll sweat in an hour to an hour and a half. So as you're doing some of these longer runs, we're going to need some salt. You don't need salt all day, everywhere, all the time, then you just sweat out more salt. Uh, but we definitely need to take some in. So if we just go through kind of quickly um, the daily needs, because unless someone comes to my office and says, oh, hi, Lauren, I'm running the marathon this Sunday and I have a few questions for you, in which case, we're not really looking at what they're eating all day at all. We're just doing the marathon, which is in four days, which is a little late to be changing anything, but sometimes we do it. Um, you know, it's always good to first take a step back, and maybe I should have brought some of those, but either I can send them to Gail to send you, or they're on my website, which is nutritionenergy.com. There's a food log on there, and to keep you honest, I should have brought them with us, but we can get them to you, and I highly recommend everybody just keep track of everything they eat for three days, maybe five days, but three to five days. And don't be embarrassed not to start. Just write it all down. And I would think most everybody will learn something. Even I would learn something if I write it down every once in a while. So you might learn as you write it down. You'll see there's a place on there where I'll write comments for thoughts and feelings. People are like, what? How deep do I have to feel about my food? <laughs> However deep you feel like feeling. But you might see that 3 o'clock every day you're writing, I'm starving, I'm starving, I'm starving. Chips, cookies, candy. OK, well, let's fix the problem. It's not the willpower, it's not you, it's not the chips, it's that you were starving. So let's just deal with that. Let's get a snack in there. Or, you know, workout one, good. Next workout, more tired, more tired, more tired. Okay, why? Something. Well, maybe you have a triplets who are two days old and you're not getting any sleep. We can't fix that. But if it has to do with food, and even if you have triplets that are two days old, you're not getting any sleep, food will help, but not all the way. Um, so then we would look and say, okay, are you missing something? Are you not getting enough carbs? Or not getting enough protein after the workout? You know, what's happening there? So a lot of what I do for clients in my office and what the dietitians in my practice do is like we're sort of detectives 
and then you complain about what's your problem, what are you talking about, what can we fix? And so it might be, oh, you need a lot more protein now that you're training and you didn't realize it. Or it might be, hey, you're not spending two hours lifting weights in the gym. You don't need 200 grams of protein, which you probably never need in the first place. Now you really don't. We need to treat some of those for carbs. So by writing everything down, you can also pick up, without me, very easy things like, it's June and I like fruit and I didn't see one on my food log for three days and there probably is a reason why I should be buying one, so I'm going to go to the fruit guy on the corner. Very simple stuff, you know? Or you have a headache every day at 2 o'clock and you realize you really don't drink anything at work. So very simple things to somewhat complicated things that you can pick up on. And if you keep a training on, like everybody keeps everything online. I have old school people, I have parted with my like high school and college training logs. I do not uh, save them anymore. But I still like to keep those things on paper. Um, maybe, I don't know, we're like not gadgety. Old school about it. Uh, but I do have a Garmin, so maybe I'm halfway. Uh, but so writing some of these things down, wherever you might keep your training log, it might be useful to write some notes on the nutrition too. Especially what you had for breakfast and what you took in during that run and then how you felt. And so you, you can notice some of those things as well as the temperature and the humidity. Or, you know, if you don't know the humidity, just like really, really humid versus felt beautifully lovely today. You know, that'll help. Um, and then in terms of fluid and what you took in. So overall training needs, we need carbs, we need protein, we need fat. Um, we need them all, so don't exclude any food groups. And um, I put some guidelines on here, but of course each one of you is different. Height, weight, goals, weight loss, weight gain, running mileage. So this isn't exactly specific. Um, but you can see five to nine servings of carbs. Protein should be included two to three times a day. I didn't bring my fake foods. I left them at the office. Um, if you want to visit them, we'll, we'll tell you where we are. Uh, all these fake foods that we can use for portion sizes. But protein foods, what are those foods? You guys know what a protein is. This is the participatory fish. Fish, fish thank you. That was a great choice, fish. Nuts. Anybody else? Nuts. Chicken. Sirloin. Sirloin. Ooh, we're going specific. Bison, anyone? <laughs> Eggs? <laughs> Tofu? <laughs> what? Beans. He wants some beans. He's getting carbs and protein from his beans. The nuts, you're getting some fat and some protein from those nuts. But we want to identify three or four foods that have protein throughout your day. Now, if you're vegan, rice and beans is going to count, right? Completely fine. Um, if you see chicken, that would count. Greek yogurt, that would count. So you should see three or four times a day, you should see something with protein. Really great for muscle recovery, muscle building. Um, part of what we do during endurance training is we break down muscle. You're just using your muscles over and over again. That's kind of why they hurt sometimes, and that's okay. Um, but then we need to just repair them. So then the carbohydrate foods, this is easy. What are carbohydrate foods? Good, bad, or indifferent. Pasta, perfect. Potatoes. Potatoes. Bran Quinoa, rice. bran muffins, corn, rice. cereal, rice, couscous. barley, couscous, fruits, milk, yogurt that's not Greek yogurt, plenty of choices. There's no shortage of carbohydrates, gluten-free versions of everything. You know, we have millions of carbohydrates. Um, so you should be including those pretty much with most meals or snacks, definitely before and after our training sessions for sure. Um, and it's funny when people are not doing that because the most common reason, uh, either they thought there was some medical reason um, that didn't exist, but they got stuck there, or they thought it was going to help them lose weight, but they're not feeling so great in training. And when we really put those carbs back before and after the training, man, people feel really good. Um, we come in with a lot more energy, too. So keep those. And then fats, those are really important. I think I still do a lot of convincing um, to try to get people to believe that fats are important and that fats don't make us fat unless you're sitting around eating way too many of them and not training for a marathon. Um, or you know, just eating the wrong ones, but good fats are really important. They decrease inflammation, so part of what happens as we're training, little things hurt in places, um, and you can talk to your coaches about what, what is hurting you and whether it's a problem. If I just ran hill repeats and my quads hurt, probably not that big of a problem. I might adjust my workout tomorrow, but I think I'm okay. I'm gonna eat some fish, I'm gonna have some good vegetables, I'm gonna have some carbs, I'm gonna be okay, but I might tell her, you know, if I'm not feeling great. You know, if a joint or things hurt, there might be some inflammation there. It might be your sneakers. It might be you ran on the wrong side of the road. It might be you just ran a lot. Um, and the good fats really help us decrease inflammation. So you might take a fish oil supplement, um, and you know you might ice things that hurt. That's very popular. You know, get the bag of frozen peas and label it for icing only because they won't taste good after they're defrosted a million times. And use the peas on whatever hurts and um, ice things down is a good idea. But then really making sure these good fats are in our diets three to five times a day, at least three times a day. So what are the good fats, the healthy fats? That was his question. Oh, yes, thank you. What are the good fats, the healthy fats that help us decrease inflammation? That tastes pretty yummy. Avocado, what else? Olive oil. 
Olive oil. Salmon. Salmon has some. Yes, the fatty fish. Good. Nuts. Seeds. Coconut oil. What else? All those kinds of healthy foods. Olives. Hummus. Because of the oils that are in there. So the foods that you think of that are high fat but healthy, they fall into that category. And they're really important. And I hear a lot of athletes, some men, but more the women, will be like, well, I don't want to waste the calories on those. Too many calories in those nuts. Da, da, da. But it's worth it. You know, so you put a little avocado in something, you absorb the nutrients better, it decreases inflammation, it tastes a heck of a lot better. You feel better, you're not hungry an hour later, so when you walk by the dude's desk with the pretzels and the Twizzlers, you can just say, hi Joe, how you doing, and keep going. So really important, you want to include those. So you're going to write everything down, and you might not like what you see, you might be happy by what you see, but at least you can do something about it. And then you might want to write a log uh, in a couple months, and then maybe again, you know, October, um, and they should look, the log should look a little different as your training increases, because it will. Um, the only other thing I would say is that, you know, there are so many types of marathoners, and you know your personality. Um, there are the types that don't actually believe they're a marathoner until after they cross the line, at which point they're still not really sure, because they didn't run it under four hours, so maybe I'm not. Well, you are. And then there are those other ones that, like, from the day they sign up for the race, which already happened, right? They're eating like they're doing the marathon that day, and that's generally not great. So rein yourself in on that a little bit, especially if you all go out together often, which is great and, you know, I encourage you to do that. Um, but remember, we, you know, he ran 35 minutes today. He doesn't need to eat like he ran a marathon today, and I'm sure he did not. Um, but to that type of mentality, you know, we're marathon training. Your friends are going to be like, you're marathon training. Finish all of my stuff that I didn't need. You're like, no, no, no. I ran, I ran three miles. I'm awesome. Thanks. You can keep that by. Um, so, you know, just keep yourself in check on those kinds of things. Before your training sessions, let's go into the sports stuff. So, how many of you train, you all did at least an hour, right? And this was in the morning or this is in the evening? The workouts with us are in the evening. Workouts in the evening. How many of you run in the mornings? Okay, good. How many of you take anything in, maybe besides your coffee, um, before you run in the mornings? Maybe, maybe not. Are they right to take it in? Are they right not to take it in? Anybody, what should we do? I think it's really going to be based on a lot of things, right? Um, if you wake up, you feel pretty good, you don't have any issues with low blood sugar, you're running a couple of miles, whatever that means to you, two, three, four, five. It's not going to take me more than an hour. This is going to be a pretty reasonable, easy run for me. I don't feel like eating anything. I'm not really hungry. I'll drink some water away I go. I didn't eat a great dinner last night because of whatever happened. I was late at work, my kid was sick, who knows. I wake up, or I'm running longer, or I'm running hard, or the workout says do hill repeats and I have to do them this morning because I can't go tonight to practice, this is gonna be a hard workout. Then I might take something in. And you wanna take in something really easy to digest. Last resort would be those gels, save those for during the run. Um, people use those before and if you have to, okay. But otherwise I would try for something like a banana, or some graham crackers, the thing I call kid snacks, like all those little crackery things that if any of you have kids or see kids, like those kids, kid snacks. Um, it could be Cheerios, pretzels, things that don't have a lot of fiber, pretty easy to digest in your mouth, taste decently yummy, a handful or two of those and out you go. If we're doing longer workouts, um, whether it's in the morning or on weekends, you're doing some of your longer runs, you know, then you might want a little more time, you do a little more breakfast. So common ones here in New York, you might get that good old bagel, probably don't need that whole bagel with like tons of stuff on it before the runs will sit in your stomach and won't feel so great but maybe a half a bagel with a little bit of peanut butter or a piece of toast with some peanut butter or some oatmeal or some kind of cereal maybe with milk if that works for your stomach maybe with the tiniest little bit of milk or a non-dairy milk if it bothers your stomach especially before the run and then when you're running in the evening which is even as a dietitian is my least favorite time to run nutritionally because you have to think about it I wake up in the morning, I wake up, I eat a banana, I don't, I eat peanut butter, I leave. But now, if you're going to do runs, and especially if they're important runs in the afternoon, you may have to adjust your lunch. Now, as a dietitian and as healthy people, of course, salad is a great idea for lunch. But if I see that the workout gale says you're running hard, do not eat that salad for lunch unless you know that it will be digested and you're going to feel fine because otherwise all you're going to be thinking about at workout is I shouldn't eat that salad for lunch. Those carrots are jiggling around. So you may have to just adjust. So it just takes a little more thought. If we're going for a nice, easy two-mile jog at 6 p.m., I might risk it. I might regret it, but that might be okay. But the harder and the more important the workouts are, you want to be careful. So then you might turn to things uh, more like a sandwich or things that are easier to digest for that lunch. Good old peanut butter and jelly sandwich that most of us had as kids. 
might be a great lunch on that day. Maybe with a couple of carrots or a red pepper or something on the side, um, but you want to be careful. And then snacks, as you get closer to the run, if you eat lunch at some sort of lunch-like time, and then you've got five, six hours before the run, most people will want some sort of snack. Um, definitely hydration, especially as it is today, and will probably continue to be most of the time for your training um, until the fall. Make sure you're really drinking no matter what you do at work. Uh, even you teachers and surgeons and people who don't always have an opportunity to drink, make sure you have fluids with you at your desk at all times. Uh, makes it much, much more enjoyable when you do your runs and much less likely that you will get injured while running when you're hydrated. Um, so make sure life easier. You're doing the hard stuff. The hard stuff is just follow the training. Get the hydration, get the nutrition in, get all that, that makes your life easier. Um, so make sure that you have some sort of a snack that works for you. It could be a cliff Bar, it could be a packet of instant oatmeal, it might be a banana. Um, you know, if you were in a real rush and realized, oh shoot, I'm hungry and practices in 15 minutes and you have some chews laying around your bag from the long run, yeah, sure, go for it. Um, but otherwise you can try to get in some other things. Um, you might take in a little bit of protein at that snack, especially if it's the longer run. So, you know, you might have an egg with the toast or some peanut butter on the toast for those longer runs. Short runs, or if you're about to get up at four in the morning, who got up at four in the morning? Yeah, and how much time did you have between when you woke up and when you started running? Um, like an hour and a half. Oh, an hour and a half! Yeah. Oh, okay. I was thinking you had about eight minutes because no. we were going somewhere really quick. Okay. Well, so for me in the morning, I'm up, I'm out, I am like, I've got three kids, I gotta come back, and then my husband wants to go for a run, and then we tag, and okay, who made the lunch, what's happening, okay, I think I got that straight. So I try to get out quickly. Um, so in those cases, you know, you're, just, you're not gonna eat much, or you're gonna eat something fast. If you had an hour and a half, um, and it could be for whatever reason, at whatever time, you might want to take in something, because then you might find, especially as this run gets longer, um, you, you know, you shouldn't be starving and hungry and stomach growling during a run. That means your muscles aren't getting what they need. And your brain isn't getting what, it's need, what it needs, which means it feels harder than it should, and you're going to feel less like running than you should. Because it should be mostly fun. Not every day is fun, but most of the time it should be fun. Um, although I didn't feel that great out there this morning, so I'm going to say it was definitely just the weather. <laughs> So hydration is super important. I am a big fan of the dorky fuel belt. I like the maximum capacity. I don't even think you sell it in the store. Like the six all around. Mm -hmm. I like to just go. I think, I don't want to think. I don't, I, sometimes I want to talk to people. But I don't want to have to come back for fluid more frequently than I need to. So I just carry that big stinking thing. And I don't need it on race day. And I used to swim. And like any swimmers, you wear like 72 bathing suits during practice. Then when you take them off, you feel great. It's kind of like that. You wear this fuel belt, kind of weighs you down. You don't look dorky. You look like you're training for the marathon. That's cool. Um, I've got all the fluid I need. My salt tabs go in there. Whatever the heck else you want. 20 bucks. And then on race day, man, you feel fast. So you're going to have to slow yourself down in the beginning. But they'll give you fluid. So the New York City Marathon serves Gatorade Endurance Formula. They have four years. That is good news. It is regular Gatorade with twice the salt, basically. So more salt for those of us marathon people um, that don't stop and sit on the sidelines between football, like the first Gatorade, but we just keep going and sweating and going and sweating for four hours, or two hours and 20 minutes for some of them, six hours for some other, for a long time. So you want to make sure you're drinking. Um, think about that liter of fluid per hour that you sweat out. You want to get somewhat close to replacing that. At least 75% of that, something to avoid your temperature going up, your body overheating, your legs cramping, and you know other things, um, headaches, all that. So you know, in order to do that, what I like to do with myself or my clients is really figure out what is my realistic pace right now for my training, and how often am I then going to need to drink? So per mile or per 10 minutes, whichever works for you, and if it's the same, great. Is usually a good way to think. Like for my fuel belt, okay, how often should I be finishing one of these fuel belt bottles, which is either eight or 10 ounces, depending on which one you have. And you say, okay, over the course of an hour, four of these bottles should be full, which is why I like six, because it doesn't get me very far. An hour and a half, I have to end up somewhere, fill them up, and then I can come home. Um, but if you're doing loops, you might be able to fill them up. So make sure you're really hydrating. Sports drink, 99% of the time, at least, uh, is a better choice than water. Uh, because you need three things out there while you're running, aside from all the gear that you're wearing. Um, but to take in, you need fluids, you need salt, and you need carbs. And so well, there's only one thing that really gives you all of those inadequate amounts, and that's the sports drink. So if you do that, there's less stuff to mess up and think about. You have plenty of time to think, but you just want to be able to relax and run. So make sure that you're drinking a sports drink. I would try the Gatorade Endurance, because that is what they are giving you. 
If that works for you, most of us it does, and you're lucky, you're fine, you train with it. If it doesn't, you really need to know that now, and then you need to make that decision. All right, do I need to wear a fuel belt on the course because I really cannot stand that flavor, and I've tried it three or four times. If you try the flavor sitting and standing here, that does not mean you will not drink it while you're running. As soon as you start sweating, they taste better. So give these three things a shot while you're running. Um, or if for some other reason you need a different drink, you're gonna need to decide, am I gonna run the marathon with this bottle? What am I gonna do about it? Um, so try those drinks in training. And really, it's hot now, so we should start. Somewhere around an hour, hour and 15, hour and a half, we really should start taking in the salt and taking in the carbs. And then on top of the sports drink, thanks for bringing these. I didn't bring any one. Really? Um, you can take any of these different types of products. Um, you know, the gels, is it like, woohoo, this is my favorite thing in the whole world, I'm gonna take a gel? No. Do we all use them and like them? Yes. Why do you like them? Because you feel better when you take them. Um, so you can switch flavors from vanilla to like margarita to chocolate to whatever. They try. There's a wide range. These are usually given out at around mile 16 or 17, these power gels. So you can try those. Um, but for the rest of the race, you would need to carry your own. So the gels you want to take beforehand. Um, your coaches will go over that again. These things are kind of cool, but um, this is like a big commitment because you have to take them very frequently and then you have to keep chewing. And most people are gonna get pretty sick of chewing these long before the marathon is over, which means you're not gonna be fueled well. So I would use these as, a, as an adjunct to the sports drinks and the gels, or if you really, that gel consistency. I know some people are just like, I cannot deal with that consistency. It's like icingy, yogurty consistency. Um, so then these work well, and then of course there are the jelly beans and all kinds of things. So you can try different products and experiment with them. Um, you can also try things like raisins um, and dried fruit. You know, those are absorbed a little bit differently and they tend to be a little harder on our gut, um, meaning if you do too many of them, you're going to be very happy, but not happy you're visiting the porta potties along the course. So don't do too much of those. Um, you know, I definitely see runners be too virtuous, like I only eat 100% healthy and then you end up in the bathroom four times, it's not worth it. So do rely on some of these sports products because they will help you. The Honey Stinger one is made out of honey, awesome, great. You know, you can totally take that one. Um, and then there are salt tablets that you might consider taking or little salt packets and maybe that's more you guys can talk about later because, you know, it's a lot of information and that's once you're training longer. But some runners um, will find they do a lot better with extra salt. I would say most marathoners should try to get in a little extra salt in the form of a salt packet or salt tablet at least once, if not one or two or three, four times during the marathon. So those are things you can practice with the training, you know. Yeah. They're on the, uh, that little You brought jar those there. too? Yeah, do you see it, the jar on top of the fluid? The okay. girl oh like yeah, the how so, awesome are you? Thanks, this is so great. Specific. It's like I have my own personal, thanks so much. Here. So happy, yeah, so here's an example. Um, and what I will say is, I don't know how many you guys carry, but I'm actually yes. speaking at your Upper West store next Thursday, so I will check the with current Doug. stock. What? With Doug's program, I think. Yeah, for your triathlete people. Great. Um, so I will check what electrolyte things you sell before yeah, I'm there. The one you're holding and um, the goo makes you want the rock chain. Okay, fine. Because they are very different. Some of them are much less salt than others. Um, so it depends who you are and what you need whether you know you want some of the ones like these where you have more flexibility, you might take a little, one or two, you might need to take more. If you just are like a bigger, taller runner and you're like, I am covered in salt everywhere, then you want some of the bigger ones because you only want to have to deal with it once every hour. You don't want to do this every 15 minutes. That gets to be annoying. But those are fantastic. Um, and so many runners, you know, if you think you need them, try them, and it makes you feel so much better because when you're just sweating and losing salt, um, you don't tend to feel so good. At some point, it can also be dangerous. I'm sure you've heard about that. Um, so you really don't want to drink just plain water. We need to replace the salt. So then when we're done, and you were alluding to this, so as you're foam rolling or icing or doing whatever it is you do, congratulate yourself. Um, you want to think about the nutrition quickly. So ideally within the first 30 minutes. So if you're finishing in the park and everybody's chatting, then I am hoping that you are all bringing something with you. Uh, that can be in your bag so that you can feel free to chat amongst yourselves and be excited and get something in. So there are plenty of sports drinks and bars that are available, like Cliff has a Builder's Bar and there's a Gatorade Recover that all have about 20 grams of protein. And 20 grams of whey protein is the most widely studied um, amount to be successful or to give us the best muscle recovery response. So most of us are looking for somewhere about 15 to 20 grams of 
predominantly whey, or if you're a vegan, pick another protein, because then you wouldn't do whey, because that's a milk protein. Um, and carbohydrates to go with it. So things like the sports drinks with protein in it, the recovery drinks, or the bars um, are available and pretty easy. If you have a couple of extra minutes or there's a smoothie place nearby, that might even be a better option. Um, we can get some fruit and some yogurt in there. You can get a Greek yogurt or something that has a little bit more protein. Fruits, antioxidants, potassium. Throw a little salt in there if they can do it. Bless you, it would taste good after a run we need salt. Um, helps us restabilize and rehydrate and also helps prevent us craving or diving into our friends and loved ones, salty, unhealthy things that you find them later that they're like, I don't even like potato chips, but I come back from my run and I just ate them all. Um, it's just because we, we need a lot of salt, so replace that salt. So a good amount of carbs. It could also just be a sandwich and a glass of milk or a sandwich and a yogurt, um, real normal food. You know, somebody made you chicken or fish and potatoes and green beans, great. That's hard to get in within 30 minutes most of the time. <coughs> Usually there's a, a bridge to that, and then there would be a meal that comes after. Yeah? How do you prevent yourself from overeating? So you come back from a long run, yeah. or not so long run, and then you, you eat a huge meal, and then you just feel awful afterwards. Good question. Did everyone hear that? How do you prevent yourself from overeating? Runners are hungry. You know, like, okay, so if you haven't heard this, not that anyone signed up for this, Running a marathon is not a weight loss plan. No one ever walked into my office and said, hi, Lauren, I want to lose weight. And I said, you need to sign up for a marathon because running makes you hungry, right? So can you lose weight while training for a marathon? Absolutely, yes, you can. But it mostly, maybe for one or two people, tend to be the guys, magically it will happen. And for most other people, it takes planning. So how to prevent being super hungry when you're done starts before. So it's if you're super hungry when you come back from your run, maybe you should take in a banana or something <coughs> before. Make sure you're hydrated. As these runs get longer, start taking in that nutrition during. There's a lot of science that shows when we take in that nutrition during, even at an hour and 15, an hour and 30 minutes, it'll save us a couple hundred calories later in the day because we won't be super starving. And then when you come back, make sure you get something in. You're in a rush, you have four kids, you're going to school, work, something. At least get in a yogurt, get in something. Don't wait a super long time. We've all had the experience, you wait super long time, either because you thought you were saving it up for this fancy dinner, or by accident, and then we eat worse and more. Um, so some of it's that, and then the other is really making sure that you're getting what you need. So like a lot of what we do is look at people's food logs and then go through and it's like, you're not getting in enough protein. And I don't know that, I made that up because I don't know anything about your food. Um, but we may be like, that's why you're hungry all the time. But that's a common reason why runners are hungry all the time. So it might be that you're not getting enough of carbs or protein or fat, so one of those. Um, so you know, really looking at it can be really useful. So while I'm on that, my office is on 57th and 6th, um, so I'm a dietitian. I don't think I said that, but anyway. Um, there's a reason why Gail brought me up here. Um, and a sports dietitian marathoner. I think I've run New York nine times-ish. Um, it's close. And so we do a bunch of things in our office. We do metabolic rate testing. So you can find out how many calories you need in a day, not just by plugging in your height, weight, age, and gender into a formula into the computer, but by refraining from food, caffeine, and exercise for four hours, coming in and breathing into this little, um, like a snorkel sort of looking thing, best I can say. So you just sit there relaxing and breathing for 10 to 15 minutes. It measures all the oxygen that you're breathing in and out, and it measures then tells us how many calories you need in a day. I'm not a calorie counter. I, I'll count calories for you and then give you a food log. I don't want you counting, I don't want to count, I want to eat food, I want you to eat food, unless you really want to count. But that number is really important and then gives me a basis for saying, okay, here are your portions of chicken and fish and rice, but here's his portions of chicken and fish and rice. So going through and making sure you're getting the right things in the right place, prevent that super hunger. Or, you know, some people gain weight while training for a marathon, not on purpose, um, and then they realize, oh, I need to take a step back and look at it. So those are all things you can do. Um, we also take insurance in our office, so my practice is called Nutrition Energy, just so you know. And a lot of health insurance coverage accepts, or cover, insurance covers nutrition. So like we're in with Oxford and Cigna and Blue Cross and Aetna, and a lot of them will cover for nutrition. Sometimes you need a diagnosis or a reason, like diabetes or high cholesterol, and sometimes you don't. Um, so if you're interested, I will stick around and I'll have some cards and we'll talk to you and Gail can find me. And we always give Team for Kids people a discount for coming in if you come in anyway. Um, but I'd be happy to talk to you about that a little bit more. 
Uh, but really, definitely write everything down and take the nutrition piece simple, uh, seriously, in a good way. Because really, I think that once you get into good habits, the nutrition should make your life easy. Like everyone comes in complaining, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm this. But like if we fuel well and put the plan into action, it should support your training so that you feel better and better each month. Um, and that's the goal. Great. And you will stick around. I will stick around. Thank you. So Lord, Lord. that fast but there is a lot of information on nutrition that you need to know and once you start getting into the 10 miles and above that is the perfect time to start experimenting with everything because you need to know that now we don't want to start a 20 mile run and you think oh gosh maybe I'll try a goo it's too late you need to know what works for you now so that you can train with it through the season and on marathon day it's a no-brainer you'll know what you want um, keep that log that she t talked about and also in your log write down the weather how you're feeling how are your shoes because when you come to a coach or when you go to anybody and say something vague like my shoes aren't working well tell us why tell us how you're feeling if you write it all down it'll be perfect um, and that's what we want and you know what that's part of the perks what you got with when you signed up for team for kids you got us you got Lauren you got everybody so use us ask us anything that's on your mind you're first timers and we love first timers and we want to share all our knowledge with you because we want you to enjoy every step of your journey so part of getting to that journey now that you know what to wear you know what to eat we need to talk about how you're going to train to run the 26.2 miles and you've already started but now Scott is going to tell you more about the training why it's so important and why we want to make this day magical for you so Scott take it away you guys have heard it already, but thank you so much for joining us for the season. And um, hopefully uh, it's not too daunting to this point. To give kind of an overview of what you're looking at for the next, we're at about 19 and a half weeks now. It's a 22 week program. Following the beginner schedule, you will have done just over 500 miles by the time you step to the starting line on race day. Um, the 500 miles, thankfully, is spread out over 20 more week, or 22 weeks. So the peak mileage you're going to do in any week is only going to be about 38 miles. Right now that seems really high and really daunting. Think of your first day of first grade. You're like, oh, I'm going to school. Somebody at some point probably told you you have to go to school 180 more times that year. You did. You completed that probably 12 more years in a row. And uh, looking back, you enjoyed the experience. You learned a lot from it. And probably one of your favorite teachers is your first grade teacher, I hope, maybe. Um, <laughs> We're the same way. It's one step at a time as you build your mileage up. The schedule's created so that you never really have a big jump. It's a real slow, gradual process over the, over the time period. To give you an idea of what's available kind of on the market with other programs, almost any marathon program for a beginner is gonna be anywhere from 16 to 20, 21 weeks, because that's kind of the general amount of time that you can step to a starting line, you can be ready to go, and your body can be adapted to what you need to do. We have 22 weeks. The reason for that is we always like to start before National Running Day, kind of get the season off and started. As you look at the training schedules, there's three training schedules that we put together, a beginner, an intermediate, and an experience plan. All three schedules near each other to a certain extent. It's just the amount of mileage you're doing, how quickly you ramp up your mileage, and how many long runs over 18 miles you do. That's the difference. If you're somebody who's never run before, have run a few 5Ks, a few 10Ks, maybe a half marathon, but now this is kind of the, the big step into distance running, beginner plan's a perfect spot. If you're somebody who's possibly done a marathon or is coming from a little bit more of an athletic background, you might want to follow the intermediate plan. And if you're somebody who's completed a marathon before and now you're looking for those time goals, that Boston qualifying, sub four hours, some specific time goals, the experience plan is a good one to follow. The fear with all distance running is kind of overuse and injury. And that's why each program is designed for a real slow buildup. As long as you follow it, you should stay relatively healthy. If you have any injury issues that come up, see one of the coaching staff, and we can kind of put you in touch with someone to get diagnosed. Also, we'll have a clinic, um, at, I believe it's going to be the end of July, where we bring in um, Dr. Andrew Rosen, a sports physician, who will kind of go over injury prevention. The training plan now is broken down into, into each week. Each week you have different types of runs, and we're going to go from the priority of the most important run to the least important. Your most important is your long run. 
If you can only make one run for the week, try to make it that, that Saturday long run. Um, you do need to supplement that with additional runs. Your long run, you're looking for a nice, easy, comfortable pace. For all the runs, we use an effort scale of one to 10. One being what you guys are doing more than a one effort right now, see me. Um, <laughs> 10 being that kind of all out, challenging the you know, eight year old you see on the sidewalk to race in the corner, that's a 10. So your long run, you're looking for a real comfortable pace, something in about a five effort level, you should be able to carry a conversation on with the person next to you for the vast majority of the run until those last few miles when the body starts getting a little more taxed. The long runs, that pace that you're doing on it should be a consistent pace. You can start a little slower, find kind of that comfortable pace and try to stay at that the entire rest of the time. It's not your time to go faster and slower because again, you're trying to get the body to adapt. Um, the body has several different systems that we're working on, how efficiently it burns the fuel that Lauren told you about that you put in, how efficiently it removes the byproducts of that burning, as well as the tear down and rebuilding of your muscles. And in order to do that, you just need a nice, steady, consistent pace for that distance. After you finish that, the uh, second most important run of your week is the quality workouts. For us, those are on Wednesdays. The quality workouts are your highest intensity workouts of the week. Those are the times that you'll see in your emails, we're doing hill repeats, where you run up and down a hill um, six to eight times. Track work, where you'll be on a track. If you don't have a track, it's where you're gonna find an area that you can measure out about a quarter mile with no streets in between, that you have to worry about stopping, less pedestrians if you can. And fart licks, tempo runs, all these different runs, and we'll explain those in the weekly email you get on the Sunday morning of exactly what they are. Those runs, that's where you wanna feel your lungs kind of burning a little, your heart rate really getting up. For a lot of those runs, you're gonna do about a mile warm up, get the body going. After that, you'll get into the workout. During the workout, especially towards the end, if you're really out of breath, if you're feeling like legs are burning, I can maybe do one, two more repeats of this, that's perfect. If you notice that if you look at, let's say your hill repeats, and you're using a watch, and you notice your time starts to get dramatically slower towards the end, you're just pushing a little too hard at the beginning and middle, so just back it down a little. Effort level, you want to be about an eight on those. Third most important run is your recovery run, which are on Mondays. For the Monday runs, we use what's called slow fossey. You start out slow, get a little faster in the middle, and finish really easy. Those runs are meant to get a little mileage on the legs, and at the same time, it's a good chance to kind of flush out the system, get out, um, and get active after your long runs. There's something called delayed onset muscle soreness, which after your long run, that afternoon, you might feel a little tired. Next Sunday morning, you'll get up, be real kind of heavy legged, but Monday, kind of that day and a half after, about 40 hours after, it kind of hits you. That's what the Monday run is for, to kind of get going, get active, and, and work that out. Your fourth most important run is your Thursday run. Again, that's another nice, easy run. Same thing, start out slow, get a little faster in the middle, finish nice and easy. And then your least important run of the week is your Sunday flex run. The kind of macro level of the schedule, you're always gonna have a rest day the day before your long run because we wanna make sure you're stepping to the start of that run fully rested, fully recovered. With that rest day, you'll notice your life changes slightly. You may be going out to the bars a little less. You may be going to bed a little earlier. You may be asking family to take care of kids, put kids down if, if that's the case. Something so you can make sure that you're ready to go on that Friday night. So Saturday morning you get up and you're, you're as fresh as you can be. Then you'll have your long run. Day after your long run is the, what we call our flex day. Listen to your body. We as coaches can't tell you how you're gonna feel. It depends on the course you ran. It depends on the conditions of the day, how well hydrated you were, how well fueled you were. So you'll get up Sunday morning, kind of see how you feel. If you feel absolutely horrible and beat up and felt like you just you know, stepped out of a boxing ring with somebody, it becomes a full rest day. Treat it like you would any other rest day, go about your normal day, include some stretching, um, if that's what you typically do. If you get up and you're like, I feel a little tired, I don't feel great, but I, I feel okay, go out and do some cross training. Cross training options, cycling, even if you just go out and bike around the park, if you got a city bike, if you're in the city, um, swimming is fantastic. It's minimal to no impact. It's a great way of getting the aerobic system working without really taxing the body too much. Um, yoga is good. 
any type of activity that kind of gets you moving, for some people, that flex day becomes the day they cut the grass, the day that they go to the grocery store, vacuum clean, sort of those more, little more active activities. And if you feel, you wake up and you feel great, follow the mileage that's on the schedule. It's a nice easy run, most of the mileage on your Sundays is gonna be anywhere from four to seven miles. Go out, nice easy run on that. Then you've got your Monday easy, your Tuesday's your rest day to recover a little bit, and then your Wednesday's your quality workout. If you're somebody who puts the gym, you either have a personal trainer, you've got friends you meet at the gym, you're just kind of hooked on doing lifting at the gym or kickboxing or any type of classes, try to keep those as far away from your long run and your quality workout as possible. So if you're a gym person, that may be bumping your quality workouts to Tuesday and going to the gym on Thursdays, or if that's not a possibility, go to the gym on Tuesday mornings. That's the kind of the way to keep them as far away from the two important runs of the week. With all your runs, keep a training log. Like Lauren said, a nutrition log of kind of what you're eating, what's going on. If you keep a training log, the more information you can have on there, the better. So if that, for some people, it's as simple as taking the, the schedule, print it out, and just writing the mileage they did next to it with their pace and a, and a smiley face or a frowny face, hopefully no frowny faces, but <laughs> it's gonna happen, um, next to it. Ideally, from a coaching standpoint, if you've got Excel spreadsheets or notebooks full of everything you can imagine, the, the temperature, the humidity, what you ate, what you drank, what shoes you were wearing, what clothes you were wearing, how you felt, what your intervals were on everything, if you have a training log like that, if anything comes up, an injury issue, you have to travel for work, um, you feel like it's just a little too much in your life, you want to back it down, you bring that training log to any of the coaches, or if you're not here, if you email tfkcoach at nyr.org, and give us your training log and your life calendar of, I'm going to a wedding these weekends, what can I do? We will rewrite your schedule. We will make the long runs fit into it. Um, a lot of times we have people traveling internationally that we can get long run in the day before they fly out, on their vacation, if they get a run or two in, great. If they don't, it's a fine. And then they come back and they're set up for another long run to go. Um, the more information you have, the better. And with that training log, come November, what's gonna happen is you're gonna be able to look at your training log, and especially the weather once we get into October, see what the temperature was, see what you were wearing, see how you felt, and you'll know exactly what you're gonna wear race day. So there's no kind of questions with that. The other kind of concern, it's 22 weeks, five runs a week, you're at 110 runs total for the program. We've had, since the time I've been here, right around 18,000 runners kind of go through that have been offered this training plan. I know of one who's done every run as scheduled, at the effort level scheduled, on the day it's scheduled. The person was also a corporate accountant, so they were a little more, uh, little more on top of routine you're gonna miss runs, it, it's part of life. And don't worry about it, don't freak out about it. If you miss a weekday run, fine. Mark it off, put in your log, move on to the next one. If you miss a long run, um, look at what the next week is. If the next week is only adding a mile, maybe two from what you previously did, no problem, come out, do that long run, and you're, you've got no problems. If you start missing three, four runs in a row because you get sick, you have to travel, or you miss more than two long runs in a row, see one of the coaches at practice, or email us. We'll kind of rewrite you and get you back on schedule. A master kind of picture, you've got three times that matter. First one, July 26th. You should be able to do 11 miles on July 26th. If you can do 11 miles then, you're good to go, you're right on track, there's gonna be no problems. Your second checkpoint is September 20th. You wanna be able to do 17 to 18 miles on September 20th. If you're again right in that range, you will have absolutely no problem. And race day, 23 miles. If you can do 23 miles, you are finishing the race without a question. Because at that point, you're in the park and there's nowhere to run. It's <laughs> <laughs> the uh, coaches are here. Anytime that you need us, we have practices Mondays, Wednesdays in Central Park, meet at 81st Street, 6.30 p.m. We have bag check there, so a lot of people coming straight from work. You can come full dress clothes. There's bathrooms there, you can change. Everything is uh, left with an individual with staff. Yes? Sorry, how many miles did you say on September 20th? Uh, 18. 18. 18. And uh, those practices, we start right at 6.30. You will be out of the park by 8 o'clock. 
as if you can only make one of the two, aim for the Wednesdays. You're gonna get a lot more out of the group mentality, group training with your quality workouts on Wednesdays. Saturdays, you get in your email every week, we'll tell you where the run is and what time it starts. This week we're meeting at eight o'clock at 81st Street, and starting after the 4th of July holiday, we'll start moving around the city. We'll be in Riverside Park, Van Cortland Park, in Brooklyn, um, the West Side Highway. We'll actually, at one point this season, we'll run all the way around the outline of Manhattan. And there's also three New York Roadrunner events that are part of the program. The long training run number one and two, which is a very low-key event. It's a fantastic way, if you've never been in a major race before, to get out. You'll do water stops, you'll run in a pack, They'll stop you every four to five miles, use bathrooms, water, regroup, and take off again. It's got pace leaders. It's a fantastic kind of first group running experience in a larger event. And then the 18 mile tune up, and that's more of a race environment, and that's an 18 mile run. All three of those you need to register via the link in the email. Um, it is a complimentary guaranteed entry as long as you register in the link via the email. If you do not register in that link in the next two weeks, do we know roughly? Uh, at least for the first one. Within the next two weeks for the first one, then uh, we can't guarantee that. And uh, any questions you have, email tfkcoach at nyrr and we'll, uh, we'll get that info out to you. And like I said, the bigger the training log you have, the more we can kind of help you guys out. But you're already two weeks done, only 20 to go. <laughs> also, I don't know, did you touch on mentors? No. Um, we also have mentors. This season we've got a little over 40 mentors, both locally here in New York, as well as across the U.S. and actually internationally. And what is the mentors? Scott? The mentors okay. are all runners who've run with us, just like you guys were. At some point in the last five to six years, they ran with Team for Kids. They've now volunteered their time to come back and mentor new runners. They're a fantastic resource for everything from your fundraising, because they've done it, to sort of how to fit everything into life, to kind of random training stuff, to just their experience. These are people that have gone through the same thing of learning where to get fitted with shoes, what they run with, what they eat. It's a fantastic resource. If you come out to our practices, you're gonna see six to eight mentors at all of the practices. Anybody who's got the shirt that says Mentor Across It, the Mentor Across It means, please talk to me, I really wanna to talk to anyone who will walk up to me. And use it. If you're not here locally, you can email us, and we'll get you in touch with a mentor in a mentor-mentee relationship, and that's another fantastic resource because there's somebody you can reach out to for the questions, everything from this expo, what is an expo, what should I do, what day should I go, and they can walk you through that, um, up to um, even putting you in touch with other runners in the area that you're in to run with. So really use the mentors, use the office staff that's here, and use the coaches. Um, combined, I think we're about 60 people this season, all here to make sure that November 1st, you step to the start line, healthy, and, uh, and our goal is to make sure that you are standing there as well informed and well prepared as you can be for the next uh, three to seven hour adventure, which will hopefully uh, <laughs> kind of start you on that road of many, many more marathons down the road. Jeremy, we need to go over? No, just in case anyone snuck in and forgot to sign in, if you could get... Um, yeah, I think we might have missed there. a few people um, there. Right. Um, well, you've got a lot of information tonight. There's more to come. Uh, we just want to make sure that you are prepared. That's one of the reasons you signed up for Team for Kids, is you, you get all of us. And um, when you run that marathon, and when you all cross that finish line with that incredible woohoo, it's going to change your life you will feel that there is nothing you cannot accomplish once you run a marathon. It will be a journey like no other. And we all wish we could go back and somehow run our first marathon again because it's that memorable. And every marathon that you run is kind of like your first one, but this will be incredibly special and we'll be there every step of the way with you. So with that, again, thank you for coming. We're gonna open it up. Lauren. Troy, you're here for any other last minute questions and thank you again and hopefully you'll get more <laughs> They're talking about running back there.